Hi, everybody. Hi, Lily. I am so excited to be interviewing you this time around. Um, Lily Kane, I'm sure everybody knows you by now, but if people don't, they should know that you are a certified health and nutrition coach. You are a certified keto uh, nutrition coach as well. And you are a fellow YouTuber. And you don't only talk about carnivore, you talk about other things as well, correct? Yeah, and I'm super excited to do this too, but I also talk about, I'll, I'll try to make videos about stress or mindset or different workout plans, but it seems a lot of people really like the what I eat in a day videos that the recipes and get the ideas around food. Exactly. And everything else matters too, like mindset and, you know, stress relief, all those things are triggers for unhealthy food consumption. So that's wonderful. And I think the biggest thing is that you have such a positive attitude just your 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 energy your vibe you know and I think this is what a lot of people love about you and I think I think it might have something to do with your inspiring story that I would love if you could share sure yes well I, I have a lot of people who leave me comments saying oh your energy your energy and whenever I see the word energy I think you've got it too you know and sometimes people lose you know use their energy in a different way, but we all have it in us. We're all made up of energy and just which kind of energy are you going to bring? But um, yes, my story, where, where I, my background starts is I, my mom and dad were both met um, out of alcoholism. So their relationship started from drugs and alcohol abuse. And then my mom and dad got a divorce because of that later when I was probably three or four years old. I don't really remember the details, but my mom gained custody. And then at that point, it she just made it kind of difficult to, for us to see our dad. She kind of put it in our heads that he was just a bad guy. Maybe he was, I don't know. But either way, we were kind of afraid of him. So when he would show up to our school to bring us Christmas presents, we'd run from him and tell the teachers to call the, the cops. And eventually my dad just stopped coming around. Um, and I kind of lost contact with him probably. I was six, seven years old, something like that. So hadn't heard from him. And then my mom continued to abuse, drugs, and alcohol. And you know, as a kid, you don't really understand what that means or what's really going on. All you know is I'm walking in the house on eggshells because it's eight in the morning. She's already drunk. Uh, she puts the wine in the, in the closet in her bedroom and she drinks it as soon as she wakes up. And then she'll drive us drunk to school. And that's just the way it is. Um, the most difficult part was that she, just like everyone else, wants to find a partner in life. And so she would just bring new men into the house every weekend or each new month. There was a new guy who was trying to replace dad who were abusive physically, verbally. Um, there was rape involved. So there was just different male figures through the re revolving door. And then um, at the age 13, my mom evicted my sister and I, which isn't really legal. But we luckily, my mom had met a really awesome guy. His name was John when I was six years old and they dated on and off for a little bit for him to understand the situation that was going on for whatever reason, I think because he was helping financially, even though he didn't have to, my mom allowed us to see him on the weekends, even though they broke up, he was, they were never married. He was never blood relation or anything like that. But, um, I think because he like bought us clothes for school and helped us out financially, um, we would, we were allowed to see him on the weekends, which gave us some sort of stability. But um, so when I became evicted when I was 13, we moved in with him for a little bit. Then my mom tried to get some help, go to AA, but then uh, we moved back in with her temporarily before she went back down um, her rabbit hole. So by the age 16, I ended up officially moving out again and then going legally and becoming emancipated because it was just a lot to have her come to the school and say I was kidnapped and all sorts of things when she kicked me out. So it was just easier to legally separate once um, things got where I was old enough to realize, you know, it's, it's better for my health mentally, physically, but also, um, you know, as much as I would love to have my mom or my dad in my life, it's just not, uh, they don't, they didn't choose that, unfortunately, even though you would think as a parent, they would choose to have kids. It seems like they didn't, they weren't ready to be parents. Yeah. And that is such a common thing that I've seen, you know, not everybody who has a child is you know, fit to be a parent, they're not ready, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think also when you when you became legally emancipated when you were 16, how how did you survive? 
So um, at that point, I had a job at Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors ice cream, um, and I had a car, and then I moved in with John. So my sister, I have a sister, she's 16 months older than me. She went off to college. So um, at that point, it was pretty easy for me to become emancipated because uh, even though you would think that people would maybe turn themselves into going towards drugs and alcohol, I involved myself in everything in school. So I was the straight A student who wanted to be in volleyball, track and field, involved in the church, involved in volunteer clubs, student government, theater, and everything I could put myself in that was a positive outlet. I think at the time, even though I didn't realize it, I did know that I wanted to be out of the house, but I didn't realize how much it brought me joy to be around other people who wanted to be better um, today than they were yesterday. And so um, I didn't know anything about being emancipated, but when it came to the point where it, it had to go that way, um, we ended up just having to reach out to people and figure out the whole process and steps behind it. And with the, the judge, you just kind of have to explain where you're going to be living, how you're going to take care of yourself, and just make sure it's safe environment. And how and where did you live? So I live with John. Okay. Wow. I see that that is incredible. And and you stayed there for how long? Well, I'm a year younger than most people when they graduate. So it was only for a year while I was a senior in high school. And then I graduated when I was 17 and then I moved to college. That's wonderful. So he really, I mean, he didn't have to, you know, it wasn't like you were related. It wasn't that they were married, him and your mother, but yet he stepped in and, and that's, that's incredible. You don't, you don't really see that. Right. Lot, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Especially, you know, I look back now because I met him when I was five or six years old. So it's been 20 years now that I still, we're still family to this day. But, um, you know, at that time I, I didn't really realize like she was cheating on him and she, you know, making it hard for him and calling the police on him. And he was taking all of this for us. And um, yeah, so he ended up finding a wife and they, so she's younger than him too. Um, and so I, they are my young parents. He's 13 years younger than my mom. She's nine years younger than him. So John and Sarah have their own two little kids now and they started their own family who are now my little sisters who are seven and four. That's incredible. That is, that's just amazing. I, I remember watching you have a YouTube video on your channel where you go into that in a little bit more detail. So people, you know, I will link it in the description box below so people can check it out. Um, and I remember like it brought me to tears when I watched it. It was so touching and emotional and inspiring, especially given that most people in your situation wouldn't have taken the route that you took, right? I mean, most people would have used that as an excuse, right? It would have been very easy to go down and feel sorry for yourself. And I'm sure maybe at some points, I don't know if you, you've gone through episodes, but some people stay there, you know, and they can't, they can't really just, you know, pull themselves out. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to cry right now. I, I'm sorry I made you emotional, but it's just, I think people, it, it really inspires a lot of people who are going through rough heart situations to see that it can end in a very great way, as in your case. I mean, you are so accomplished. You're, you, you were a straight A student. You got not only that, I mean, all the other things you were doing. And now, of course, being in the, uh, in YouTube, you're doing amazing and in the carnivore community. So, you know, kudos to you. And I'm sure you're very proud of yourself and where you are right now. Thank you. Yes, I I get so much joy and fulfillment from helping other people. And I knew I wanted to start a YouTube channel where whatever I talk about, I didn't really have the goal of it being health and nutrition, but I just wanted to, I know that especially when I started, it was during COVID and I wanted just to bring some more light to this dark world because I knew what it was like to have gone through some tough times. But I know it sounds really strange because I used Nobody at my school knew I was going through a lot of this stuff. Maybe my close friends and my boyfriend at the time, their parents knew and they were not allowed to come over to my house. But um, everybody else, they thought I was just like a happy person and a go-lucky person. And then meanwhile, I'd go home and I'd cry myself to sleep or the police would be over all the time. So no one really knew. Um, and to be honest, at the time too, I knew that it wasn't normal. I knew other people didn't have that, but I didn't know what normal felt like, that it's really hard for me to, at this point now, explain how did you get through it? Because it was just, 
I don't know, something yeah. inside of me was like, hey, you can make the best out of the situation. Between my sister and I, she used to, um, there's two kinds of personalities, I guess, but when my mom would obviously say things kind of irrational or completely just straight up wrong because she didn't remember or she blacked out or whatever, um, she would, you know, try to attack us and my sister would try to stand up for us being like, no mom, you're wrong. This is what happened. But I would be like, oh, I, I just quickly learned that it doesn't help adding more fuel to the fire. Instead, I was like the peacemaker of whatever you want. Do you want me to give you a back massage? Like, you know, so yeah that's yeah and i I've, I've had i wouldn't say a, a, an experience um that extreme but i'm definitely familiar with abuse and um and i like you said when you're born into it mm -hmm. you think it's normal and it's only until you remove yourself so fully from that situation that you fully realize the horrors of what you went through and how you know that's that shouldn't be the case you know no one should have to go through that but the silver lining is that and you can i don't know tell me if you feel that same way as well i feel like it, it gives you more emotional intelligence because you have to always be aware for any blow up any you know you're because you're constantly walking on eggshells right so i feel like that contributes to why you're such an amazing interviewer when you're chatting with someone you're conversating you pick up on subtle emotions more so than somebody who never really went through that right wow yeah i mean i guess so i never really thought about it like that too but i also know and i'm sure you can relate too but it makes you just a little bit tougher so something that i actually struggled with was having empathy for people because they would say oh well you know i can't do x y and z and i really had a hard time with like I'd be like, you don't even know, but I've come to understand now that somebody else can have a completely different situation that was on paper easier, but they could have emotionally taken it way different than I did. So for me, in a way, I feel very lucky that I at least took mine in a way that didn't make disempower me and, and make me have depressive thoughts and, and go down that route. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, and also resilience, like you just said, yeah, it, it makes you tougher for sure. And so now when it's like you're you're building something, let's say you're building your brand with YouTube right now, most people would have probably, if they don't see like the viral thing going right away, would have given up. But you know, like this is this is easy for you. So you can keep pressing through, right? Right. Well, and a lot of people too, they um they might understand that when it comes to putting yourself out there, that it's challenging, but that people will, will write things that obviously are mean. But I don't think people really understand that like every day, like multiple comments I get about how, you know, I need to have braces, I'm ugly, I'm dumb, I talk funny, I use my eyebrows too much and that I'm fake. I'm, you know, they just list you, an animal killer, you know, they just go down the list of things where you're like, what? Like, at first, it made, like, when they first started getting the negative feedback, I was crying my eyes, oh my gosh, and then I had to get to the point where I'm like, I don't know these people, they don't know me, they don't know what I'm really trying to do in my heart, that it's not trying to be anything but good and bring good information to people, and um, yeah, so when people try to bring you down, which they always will, whether you put yourself on social media or you're at work, people are always going to try to bring you down, but um, I just try to bless them, and I've honestly changed some people's minds when they uh, write a comment, whether something, whatever they write, I'll say, why did you comment this? And it gives them a moment to stop and be like, why was I being so mean to a stranger who I don't know? Yeah, that's, that's a good way to, yeah, I've never thought of saying that, but yeah, it's so true, you know, it's like the, the, the smallest things, you know, oh, your nails, like I love to have, you know, nails that are longer than I guess what a professor normally has or things like that, like, oh, your nails are distracting or, you know, like th things you've never thought, eyebrows, I'm like, what's wrong with my eyebrows? Like, I've never thought of that ever in my entire life, you know, and, um, it's it's quite interesting though that what what I've noticed and I think you you mentioned that as well we adapt to that you develop thick skin like the first time it happens it, it you kind of take a moment to think about it but then like by the second time the third time eventually like right now I used to like remove comments or block and up I don't care they can say whatever they want you know and you just it doesn't affect you because you know what that's 
a reflection that you're growing, that people are actually paying attention to the content and to the energy and to everything you're putting out in this world. Because if nobody knew you existed, nobody would have taken a moment to say something negative, you know, about that. So that's really, that's how I think about it. Right. And you never know what people are going through. Not that that's ever really an excuse to be mean to somebody, but, um, you know, I understand that not every, you know, I feel like I do a lot of mindset work and I understand not everybody does that. And so I feel honestly, I, I don't feel bad for people because I do mindset work. So I know not to spend my time feeling bad for other people, but, um, I do know that people are going through stuff or something inside of themselves, uh, is, is wrong where they are whether we want to call the word jealous or there's yeah. something about it where they can't resist. They have to let it out that they don't like you. And, um, it's, it's, I, you know, I feel bad for them. So I will leave, I will give a blessing to them. I'll see, I'll say yeah. their name and I'll say, Hey, yeah. I hope they have a better day or yeah. they find the right food or the something that's going to help make them feel better. You're so right. It is the saddest thing. You know, if you really think about it, those are the saddest people, the people that not only are taking t time out of their day um, to comment on somebody they don't know, but then to put in negative energy, like it's you're literally telling the universe that you don't want success to come to you because it's triggering you. You know, anything that's positive that's being put out there, you're when you're when you're hating on that, when you're being negative you're never going to get there ever, not in a million years, you know? So it's, it's really, really sad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to ask you about is, um, I think something that we have in common is that our partners kind of are the ones who put us more on a carnivore based diet just by doing it themselves. Right. And I think that's important for people to realize like, just how important it is to do those things together. Maybe you can share your experience of how you got into that, you know, carnivore or just doesn't have to be carnivore. I know I think it's a it's a good thing that I picked up from your videos that, you know, you don't want to be labeled. And I think that's such a great, great thing you said. And maybe we can also touch upon that. But let's talk about that and, you know, how you got into a more animal based diet. Sure. So when I, um, growing up, I was pretty poor. So we had a lot of like top ramen, um, hot dogs and frozen peas. And I did not feel like I was under eating, but now that I look back on it, I probably was in a calorie deficit my whole life. And I was involved in track and field and volleyball. So I was also working out a lot. And so I was always told I was too skinny, chicken legs, anorexic, all this stuff when I was growing up. And so when I went to college and I had the option for all you can eat and the whole buffet, I was like, yes. And at that point too, I, maybe there was the image out there that it's, it's more attractive to have curves and thick thighs was what I was told. So I gained 15 pounds my freshman year and I was so happy about it. I was like, yes, finally I can fit in. And by the end of my, by the end of college, um, I was 120 pounds, which I'm five foot two, and that's probably a fine weight for me. Um, and I was also a competitive athlete, so I was working out three to six hours a day, and I had a lot of muscle. I pretty much broke my knees at that point, and I was like, my knees are in so much pain, my shins hurt, I was a hurdler, I was a triple jumper. So when I finished my career with track and field, I was like, I'm never running again. I'm not taking another step and I'm not going to the gym. And after a year of not going to the gym, I watched my 120 pounds of muscle turn into probably 120 pounds more that has fat. And I didn't even realize it either because I just thought I was, I was still looked, looked fair, you know, fairly fine. And I met my partner who I met him. I was like, oh, let's go get donuts. And he was like, oh, I don't want to have donuts, but I can drive you. Of course, I'll, I'll drive you to get donuts. And for some reason, that just bothered me. You know, I want to do these things together. <laughs> and then um, I was like, let's have quesadillas and paninis. And no one ever taught me anything about health and nutrition. So I thought I was eating a balanced diet. And then he made some adjustments and started eating similar things to me because he didn't want to be the weirdo when you first start dating someone to be like, no, I don't have chips, pizza, cookies, donuts, you know, all the lists. So he would have things with me. And eventually in time, it got to the point where his health started physically, you could see it pretty easily, things ha were happening with him. 
and um, because he has an autoimmune condition. So he had already done keto prior to me, years before me. And then when we started, he started eating the Lily Kane diet, he realized I can't keep doing this. So he slowly started saying, hey, I'm just not going to have bread this week. I'm just, and so I was like, okay, we're not buying it this week, but next week we'll buy it. Oh, we're not, I'm not going to buy rice this week. So it was like slowly he started taking things out where the intention in my mind was never, I'm doing this forever. It's just, this is for the week. And I can, of course, go and buy it. He never said, you can't have it, Lily. He's just saying, I, I can't, I have to do this for myself. So um, just because honestly, I always say it on my channel as it's just easier for us to cook and clean together, which is the truth. But uh, I'm just kind of lazy. So otherwise, I would just go to the grocery store and buy something else. But obviously, I'm not doing that. Or I'm just not prioritizing my, my time there. So I um, eventually just started having less fruits because I was like, started learning about sugars and started learning about Dr. Gundry and started learning more. He was saying that maybe the broccoli and the, the Brussels sprouts and the cauliflower were bothering, bothering my partner. So eventually, I just started having less and less. And then now, here we are where... I eat more carnivore and I have learned all the terminology. I understand now what's going on. But before it was just, I'm just going to have less of it, not with the intention of permanency. Yeah, I think, I think that's what a lot of people also should do. Um, I know that's how I transitioned into a more carnivore because to tell somebody just eat meat or just eat animal based would not have all the salads, even things that are, we, we believe are so healthy for us, all the vegetables, all the salads, all the fruits, you know, uh, you know, whole grains, these things, we're so deep into that. And for me, just telling myself, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, just one week, you know, and then it was just two weeks. And then it was like just one month, just to see out of curiosity, what would happen if I eliminated all of those things that I normally ate. And once you do that, I think you realize that you're not going to die <laughs> on this diet, you know, and you're not going to have like negative uh, mood states or, or terrible cravings. You know, you see that you've survived. And not only that, then you start seeing all the benefits, which brings me to all the benefits that you saw. What can you share with us that made you kind of like convince you that this is probably a better way of eating? Well, actually, within the, without even going keto or anything like that, just having less carbs and less sugar, um, less processed foods, I lost the 15 pounds very, very fast. Um, and immediately people were like, something's different with your face because I really held a lot of it in my face. Um, so lost 15 pounds pretty much immediately. And then um, as far as like removing more and more things, my knees, because I had so much inflammation in my knees and pain in my knees, less pain there. Um, being able to sleep deeper, I feel like fall asleep faster too because I wasn't having dessert right before bed, keeping me a little bit wired and awake. Um, also, just the biggest benefit for me, not feeling like I'm being dictated by what my food choices are, where I'm not like, I need to have a donut, I need to have hot Cheetos, I need to have these things because without those things, I'm not gonna have a good life, I'm not gonna have fun and things aren't gonna be tasty. Um, so being able to feel like my brain is not being controlled by these things and I'm finally making a choice for myself and just overall the brain function. So being able to feel like at the time eating everything, I did not think that I, like I said, I was always a pretty happy person. So it was never like I felt like I, I was living in a black and white world, but now hindsight's 2020 and I feel like Yes, back then I would have mood swings. My, I would have peaks of energy and then a crash. And then I would cry all the time, whether I'm watching a chick flick or someone said something. Um, and so, so, yes, I would say being able to feel like I finally have my brain back uh, is the biggest benefit for me. That's amazing. Yeah, I think mental health, I think for me also mental health is a huge reason that keeps me wanting to eat this way because because of those mood swings and the ups and downs and I still I'm I'm very emotional so I, I'll still cry <laughs> um like with movies very easily but that you know it's it's not because I'm in a negative mood state you know or you know I I'm jittery I remember when I used to eat what in nutrition school they taught us you know all the carbs when I used to eat all those things I remember I couldn't like in two three hours if it was time to eat I would literally feel like my blood pressure has dropped mm -hmm. I needed to eat something like right then and there you know and I think that's 
that kind of like um, dependency is is awful, you know? Right. It feel it feels like you have more time back in a way because you're not. I felt like I was like, okay, you have to go get a snack. Okay, now I want to eat again. Now I want to have a snack. Now I want to eat again. You don't realize all the little times you're spending time, plus also all of the money. Even though it seems like buying a bag of chips is incredibly less expensive than buying some steak, in reality, it's going to add up in terms of the way that you feel, you're not going to be able, when maybe you'll get sick easier. I haven't been sick in years now, but you know, maybe I'd have to pull out of work or I would have things I wouldn't be able to do because I was sick, but then also maybe I'll have an expensive medical bill in the future because I was having all these things, or I'll have to go on this crazy weight loss journey that I watched so many people do that. Luckily, um, I haven't had to, you know, at 22, I, I found low carb. <laughs> Yeah, you're so lucky that you found it at such a young age because I know if had I had done that that uh, when I was 22, I would have never struggled so much for all these years. And because over time you develop more and more kind of like connections, you know, with your d mood states and addictive foods. And the sooner you tackle that, the less likelihood you have to lay down those habits. And so it becomes easier to overcome that. So yeah, I'm so glad that, you know, you're doing this at, at a very young age. Also for anti-aging purposes, you know, because it's going to give you so much more quality life compared to somebody who ate all the carbs for the next 10 years and then started carnivore, you know, or animal-based. Yeah, and I, I wish I could tell people that too. Not the anti-aging things. Obviously, I, I haven't experienced it personally in terms of like seeing what the results were, were from me doing this. But even still, I have friends and people my age who they say, Lily, I'm not going to not have cookies because cookies give me so much happiness and I don't want to live a life without cookies. And I get it. I get it. That's what I said about donuts. But once it, they're removed, to now I realize that's a very addictive thing to say and that there are so many other things that I can eat and do in a day that can bring me that happiness that I gave the cookies the power to have for me. True. True. Because cookies are giving you happiness for the time that you're actually eating it you know maybe for the next five minutes but the moment it ended automatically your brain wants more automatically that that euphoria went away whereas when you remove your addiction to those things you're happy all the time so you've increased your happiness by like 99 percent of the time because the vast majority of the day you're you're not just you know having happiness in like a few minute bouts you know that's amazing. Also, um, with regards to labels, can we talk about the carnivore label, please? <laughs> yes. Well, for me, I was eating carnivore without knowing I was eating carnivore. And I thought I was eating keto. So I thought I was eating keto. And I put out a video, my first video um, about food and what I eat and carnivore, which was in January. So a year now, it's been up. So a year ago was my video on YouTube and I showed Bryce the video before I posted it and he goes, you know, it's called carnivore. And I was like, oh, okay. And I, so that's what I learned is the day I posted that video, it's carnivore. And he said, make sure not to call it a diet because this is a lifestyle. I said, got it, got it. Um, and then after that, I called it carnivore diet maybe a couple more times after that for some videos and then realized I'm not calling it carnivore diet anymore. I'll interview people. I'll put it in the, the title, I'll put it in the thumbnail so people understand I eat pretty carnivore. But um, when it came to people asking, so all you drink is water. I actually don't drink coffee, but I will put some lemon in my water. But yeah. would a lion put lemon in his water? No, lions don't drink lemons. <laughs> um, can a lion add seasoning onto his meat? I put seasonings on my meat. Um, and I just got to the point where I started realizing some people, the word carnivore means a lot to them. It means animal foods, period. It does not mean sometimes having blueberries. It does not mean sometimes having something else. Um, and even though people use carnivore and they still have coffee, uh, I just figured I'm not going to go down that route. I'm just going to call it the Lily Kane diet is honestly what I call it, but um, because it's something that for me is going to evolve and change over time, and I'm going to reintroduce certain foods, I'm going to take other foods out, and I'm just going to play what works best for me over the time, because saying that I have to eat a certain way does not work well with me, and I understand that for some people, they need to have that structure, um, but for me, it puts me in a bubble of like, it's a no food, and I don't like being told it's a no food. For me, I say, sure, I can have donuts, 
I'm an adult. I can go buy some right now. Uh, have I had donuts in years? No, I haven't had fast food in a decade. I haven't had soda since I was like six. So there are just things that I know I don't want and I don't choose to have those foods. But if I want to choose to have one today, I can. Yeah, I, I, I think that's great. And I think um, sometimes we do this to ourselves. We start unconsciously labeling ourselves. And it's like, if I want to talk about so if I want to publish a YouTube video on something that includes some vegetable, for example, I'll think twice like, oh, wait a second, you know, and, and it shouldn't be like that because, you know, I'm like, just like you, we're not stuck in, in this, we're not doing this for, for like, I don't know, like, um, like, a, I don't know what, what else I should say, but we're, we're not doing this just to belong to a community. We don't have such a deep connection to it. We're doing it because we believe at the moment, based on what we've read so far and what we've researched so far, it appears that eating more animal-based seems to be the healthiest diet and it makes us feel good. But if in a, in a year from now, some new research shows up or maybe a personal experience you know, tells me that I could add some other foods. It's fine. It's okay. You know, we don't have to label ourselves as, you know, a carnivore doctor or a carnivore lily cane. No, we just, that's what we eat. That's not who we are, you know? Right. And even I know because a lot of the people listening or who, um, who follow us, they eat more animal based or carnivore. And so they think that that is the, the holy grail. And I would love that to be the case. The thing, though, is I have a lot of people tell me red meat causes cancer. Now, that straight up doesn't make any sense to me because if someone had one piece, if a, if a baby is born into this world and they have a piece of meat, does that mean they have cancer then? Because that's what causes means. So I understand that when people say certain things, they don't really understand the, the word. So I try to be very careful with how I present things because even me, I do not think that a vegetarian diet is not possible. I think someone, there's 7 billion people on the planet, of course someone can eat vegetarian and be healthy, whether they have to use supplements or they have to do whatever they got to do, but it is definitely possible to be a vegetarian and be healthy, um, and so that's where it gets tough for me to be like, this is, this is the way and the only way, because I know that it's, statistically speaking, <laughs> we can't prove anything, and therefore I'm not going to say anything's possible or not possible, because at the end of the day, yeah. people have been flying to the moon, inventing airplanes and iPhone, things we would have never imagined. So that's kind of where I stand. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree that um, things are changing and that's that's just how science is. It changes every day, you know. Um, and in the future, hopefully the recommendations will update, will be updated to reflect the science, the emerging science, although it usually takes a longer time than, you know, than people who are in the field. So I know we talk a lot about, you know, nutrition and, and, and uh, you know, what we eat and things like that. I think, though, something that maybe our audience might be interested in is starting a YouTube channel. So I, because I, I get people asking me about this a lot, and I wanted to film something about that, but, you know, eventually maybe I will, but right now it's like, I'm just trying to keep up, you know, with all the nutrition stuff. Um, but what, what can you share with us with regards to your experience starting a YouTube channel? I would say consistency would be my biggest tip. Um, and then once a video that you have does well, continue making that exact video because that was something I did not, nobody said to me where mm -hmm. I had this video, the what I eat in a day video, uh, go viral. And then I've made the next video on how I make myself feel more beautiful. And then the next video was how I, and it was just like totally off topic. And I feel like had I consistently just made what I eat in a day videos or explain some of the questions people were giving me, then um, I would have performed um, better. But um, yeah, you gotta stick to a niche. Unfortunately, I have tried even still to this day, I try to not do that. I try to talk about stress. I talk, try to talk about energy. I try to talk about mindset. And it consistently is, no, girl, just keep talking about food. <laughs> so um, staying in a niche for sure. And then when you figure out, you don't have to know your niche initially, 
my channel started off as a DIY arts and craft channel. Right. <laughs> and, um, then I started thinking, okay, let me try talking about trends. Let me try talking about what to get your spouse for Valentine's Day. Let me try talking about what I eat in a day. And then boom. So I would say just keep throwing stuff out there and then whatever, whatever sticks, keep talking about that. Exactly. And so at first, yeah, you can throw a wide net, all the things that you are interested in, and then you'll see of all the things that you are interested in, what is the audience most interested in, and then you do that. And I think also eventually you can branch out, but it's so important to kind of, kind of niche down in the beginning, right? To grow enough of an audience, get there faster. And then once people know you, they like you, they, they're they more likely to click on your perspective on some other topic, you know? So for example, mindset, they'll, they'll go with you versus somebody they've never heard about before for mindset topics. Right, well, and have fun too. I guess I should put that one out there because, um, I feel like I watch a lot of, I can watch some YouTube videos that to me, I'm like falling asleep a little bit. Um, so I think that people caught on to me because I was just like moving pretty quickly. The average attention span is 18 seconds. So I'm just like, gotta jam, jam, jam and go because um, I want people to get value and get information. And if I'm doing it too boring or too slow, then, um, you know, you're not going to be able to get your message out there. So try to make it fun and have fun yourself because you'll definitely get to points in time where you're like, I don't want to make a video and this is a ton of work. But um, if you, when you focus on like, I get to make a video and I choose to do this, then it makes it more enjoyable and the energy that you give off to your audience, they'll be able to feel that. Yeah. And, and also, um, let's, let's talk about a little bit of numbers in terms of how long it took you to get, which is what most people who are thinking about a YouTube channel, how long did it take you to get your first 1000 subscribers? Cause that's like a big goal, right? Um, my first 1000 subscribers granted again, I had a DIY craft channel. So that started in November, 2020. And I had my first 1000 in March of 2020, but I posted my first carnivore video. Wait, you started in November 2020? Sorry, November, November, November 2020 to March 1st, 2021. Okay. So what is that? Three, five months? But yeah. then so March 1st, I had 1,000 and now we're January. So that's nine months later, I have 20,000. Wow. Yeah, that's the, that's the key here. It'll yeah. blow up eventually or, you know, it'll just, the, the progress is going to happen a lot faster, but you have to, you have to give yourself time for those first 1000. And also I think your channel grew really quickly compared to other channels, given that you got your first 1000 in a different topic, you know, it wasn't, it's not like you started nutrition, diet stuff, you know, and, and then, yeah, well, I had my first, I was at 500 before carnivore. And then once I went from car talking about carnivore, then it went to 1000 in a month. So it was like 1000. And then interesting. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, that's wonderful. And Let's let's do just one more thing that I forgot to ask you earlier. We we're still talking about you know living with somebody um, who shares the same diet that you have. Um, how important would you say it is to keep the stuff that you know only the stuff that you guys are going to eat? That's like the only thing that's going to be in the house. How how much emphasis do you put on that? Do you do you do you have anything else in the fridge in the pantry? I would say, especially initially, I would have nothing in the house that I'm not eating. We also just in general like to have a very clean kitchen and cabinets and fridge and we we don't like wasting food either and it's something I find a you know a lot of people kind of are wasteful um whether they forget they have the food and it expires or they just toss it out but we initially were living in another home when we started eating this way which was filled with chips and crackers and cookies and brownies and everything it was filled like more than a grocery store I swear but uh it was very tempting for me and it made me actually I think become more into this faster because it was like so frustrating to watch people do that to me that it made me like gun ho even faster because I was like I don't want to be like this one day um 
and then but then it was still tempting because I see it all the time and it's like glowing and glistening with its colors <laughs> now now we went back to that home recently and I noticed I don't look at it at all I don't notice it's there and if anything I just think like not no thanks <laughs> Yeah, and the less the less you eat it, the less likely you are to be tempted, right? Because the moment you take a bite, that's the problem. Because it reminds your brain, you know, you release all that dopamine and all that addiction comes back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, last question. Have you noticed any difference with um with women in this sphere versus the men in this sphere, how they are treated, you know, the reaction to them, um, you know, just looking at, you know, gender equality or inequality um, in what we're doing. Yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> you definitely see, I mean, I see Dr. Kevin Stock, Dr. Sean Baker, um, Keto Savage, Robert Sykes, I see these men who are pretty chiseled, look great, strong, healthy, vibrant men who are great leaders and role models, and I think a lot of people look up to them, Liver King, um, but, with, as, and I'm sure they get it, I'm sure they get the messages, I know Liver King, everyone thinks he's, he's juicing, but <laughs> with women, it seems that it just can be a little bit less appropriate to be having so much meat whereas a men eat steak and the women it's more like are you sure this is okay and then coming you know I see a lot of unfortunately people being pretty rude to the women saying they either look too skinny not healthy their face is too skinny whatever whatever it is it seems like um unfortunately you know they're they're quite yeah hard. Yeah, people feel like they have a license to give their opinion on a woman's appearance a lot more than than a man's appearance, you know. And then also, um, like they can't they can't wrap their heads around um, a woman, a strong woman, an independent, strong, smart woman um, that's also wearing what she wants to wear, not what society you know deems is appropriate you know so I see that as well on my end not a lot but I think it's it, eventually it probably because I I've seen bigger accounts and I know what's going to happen <laughs> so yeah and I wouldn't say that the majority of people might have to worry about this as much I would say the majority of people who just have their own life um their family and friends are mostly just gonna be like wow what are you doing like you look so great um but I don't see that hopefully being a problem for most people who don't put themselves out there on social media able to be attacked yeah yeah no it should never be a deterrent for sure no matter what whether you put yourself out there or not um I think you, I I've noticed that you adapt to it so quickly much quicker than what I thought like it doesn't even phase you eventually um so yeah we're we're not discouraging anybody <laughs> here awesome um Lily where can people find you I'm on YouTube, but my channel is called Lily Kane, and then on Instagram, Lily Kane underscore YouTube, on Facebook, Lily Kane, and on TikTok, Lily Kane underscore YouTube. Awesome. I'm going to post all of those handles also in the description box below so people can just get there quicker. Thank you so, so much. This has been really fun. Um, I'm sure we're, we'll do some more things in the future, especially given the reaction for our first chat that we had on your channel, which I will also link below. So um, thank you for doing this. And, you know, I appreciate your energy and I appreciate all the content that you are putting out there because we need, definitely need more women and more um, people in, in what we're doing in this community. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. You had great questions. It was um, nice chatting with you and connecting again because I know what you're doing and how many people you're impacting, what you're putting out is something that you know, inspires me and makes me happy to be a part of this whole thing with you too, because, you know, that's what the goal is to be a community of helping one another, because no one should really have to go through life alone. We're humans, we're social beings. 100%. Thank you so much, Lily, and I hope you have a wonderful day today. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye.